Denmark. Now I call upon present sponsorship officer, Anjali Ramanathan Christchurch, to open the case for opposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Like every law student, I have been taught to place great value on definitions. So in order to have a clear debate today, we need to have a working definition of the concept central to this motion, social justice. We see and use this phrase a lot. You'll find it all over Instagram infographics, in new lesson plans that are being taught at schools. And it's a favorite phrase of really anyone who wants to sound progressive, whether that's politicians or just your friend who started going to protests recently. It's probably also included in the answer you'll get from some law students, at least those who aren't corporate law sellouts, who don't know exactly what they want to do with their careers when you ask why they decided to study law. <laughs> By one definition, social justice is fairness as it manifests in society. This might be described as justice in terms of the distribution of wealth, opportunities, and privileges within a society. But the problem here is that we could have another debate altogether about what kind of distribution can be classified as just. This is why I believe that the best definition of social justice, in its essence, is the endeavor to bridge the gap between the ideals set out by a democracy and the reality of life within that democracy. Social justice is aspirational, but it isn't about changing society into something that none of us recognize. It's simply the practice of striving to uphold the promises a society makes to each of its members. As an American, if my accent doesn't give me away, I'm used to these promises being set out in a central document. But those same ideals, enlightenment ideals, liberty, justice, and equality, are entrenched in this country too. So now that we've defined the key term for tonight, my argument becomes quite straightforward. If we can agree that these ideals matter and that politicians should care about them when legislating, then we must accept that judges, when interpreting the law, will, and indeed ought, to look to those values too. If we can agree that the courtroom presents an opportunity to advance social justice, and that opportunity should not be taken away, we all must vote opposition. But before I continue, it falls upon me to introduce the proposition speakers. Opening the case for the proposition, we just heard from the illustrious Amy Gregg, development officer at the Oxford Union and DPhil candidate in law. She is also, famously, a former president of the Cambridge Union. <laughs> and I'm told that Amy is much better at being a law tutor than she is at running for president of the Oxford <laughs> Union. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from the Right Honorable Lord Hoffman, whose judgment was the subject of my tutorial essay last week. <laughs> and I hope, by the end of this speech, he'll be somewhat as familiar with my opinions as I am with his. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll hear from Jeffrey Dudgeon, MBE, who I actually had to double check was speaking for the proposition since he's known for bringing the case to the European Court of Human Rights, which successfully challenged Northern Ireland's laws criminalizing homosexuality. Now to me, that sounds like quite a good example of the courtroom advancing social justice, but I'm sure he'll tell us more. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we are gonna hear from Larissa Korber, who's a second year lawyer at Mansfield, and also the women's officer here at the Oxford Union. I'm not that surprised to see her on that bench because she's one of those corporate sellouts I was talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guests and they are most welcome. <laughs> I'll now make my argument in two parts. First, the task of interpreting and declaring the law which is the task of judges, always involves the introduction of bias. Second, that the electoral process in democracies inherently and structurally fails minority groups, and the courts have an opportunity to ameliorate this. So first, the task of judges, interpretation, necessarily assigns some character to the law. As lawyers, we don't often apply to judges the same bias examinations that we give to, say, journalists. The reality, however, is that the values held by a judge will influence the view of the law, and therefore the manner in which they interpret the law. And though the principles of statutory interpretation require UK Supreme Court judges to interpret legislation in accordance with the pur purpose that it was intended to achieve, we have to recognize that even that instruction leaves room for human decision making. And if it didn't, there really wouldn't be a point in even having judges. 
The common problem, as Amy so rightfully points out, is that the judiciary tends to be older, more male, and well, wider than Parliament or Congress back home. This leads many to say that social justice issues would be better handled by elected bodies. But the real conclusion that we should be drawing here is that when issues affecting minorities land in front of judges, as they very often do, we ought to hope that those judges will use their albeit limited interpreted power for the cause of social justice. Simply put, we want judges to care about those ideals that we should hold as a society. And second, but before I go any further, as a quick disclaimer, I've done one term's worth of UK constitutional law, whereas I have a decade's worth of schooling that covers UK Supreme, US Supreme Court decisions, and so you'll probably be able to tell that from what I say next, um, which is that in the US, the courts have long been the forum for the advancement of social justice, or sorry, a forum. Um, the first UK, uh, US Supreme Court decision I learned about was Brown versus the Board of Education, which you may have heard of, in which the court ruled that US state laws establishing racial segregation in public schools were unconstitutional, even if those segregated schools were found to be otherwise equal in quality. This decision changed the course of the civil rights movement, opening the door to desegregation in all areas of life. It also created a basis for federal policies such as busing, which allowed the government to force resistant states to integrate schools. Desegregation could never have happened at the ballot box. It, not now, sorry. It wasn't until 10 years after Brown that major legislation came about to support the cause of desegregation. White politicians with white constituents had very little incentive to take the issue up, and it would have failed if brought onto the ballot at the state level. The fact is, people don't bother to vote on issues that don't affect them, and people are unfortunately very reluctant to vote away their privilege. When courts are given the opportunity to make a decision which benefits a group which, based on its size, will continually be electorally disenfranchised, whether it's out of a care for the cause of social justice or simply an obligation to interpret in line with the Human Rights Act, sorry, no, no. Um, judges can and should make valuable contributions to the advancement of social justice. So I'll end with this. The courtroom can't be the primary forum for social justice. We have to hope that our elected representatives and the legislative process will advance the ideals that we all value. We have tools such as protests to encourage that. But when social justice issues land in the hands of judges, as they often, has and in, often have and in my view always will, we must hope that interpretive power results in judges making decisions that bring society closer to the ideal. And that is why I urge you all to oppose tonight's motion. 